All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Um, I'm coming to you from a cabin in Maine today. Oh, yeah. Oh, you're still there. Ah, I was wondering how you're going to do this. <laughs> I'll be back in New York on Sunday. Um, it's good to see you all. I th thought we had a productive um, last meeting two weeks ago. Um, got through a, a big portion of our table. Um, and the segments that are, are really left to discuss in that table all revolve around transfer development rights. Um, I think there's been a lot of discussion about how that can happen. I've had some, uh, I think, out of group discussions with Joel about some ideas he has for how that it could work differently. Um, so I think I'm gonna start by uh, putting up a slide with the table. Um, so that uh, we can be reminded of where we're at with that. Speaking of which, the I have a copy of the table on my screen. The one online on the website is not updated with the information from two weeks ago. I believe that. Um, all right. So I'm sharing this page from the presentation I gave to the town board with the the things that we had agreed on in the last meeting and where we had gotten and what we have left, uh, what we have left to work on. Um, so we, we worked through the basic standards for all four of our proposed zones. And the things that we have left are the things that are in gray here. Um, setbacks for cl new clusters, the max development rights that can be transferred to a lot if there's gonna be and then what they would be a development rights multiplier, um, the max residential units on a lot, including transfer of development rights. Um, but I think there's some some slightly more foundational discussion to have here um, before we dive into the numbers. Um, and, and part of that was just where we're going to allow development rights to transfer from and where they can transfer to. Uh, in the way this is set up, um, my initial proposal, there is a strong um, incentive to transfer development rights from the higher priority preservation areas to the lower priority preservation areas. Um, that incentive is given with a development rights multiplier that you get when you transfer away from the higher preservation areas. Um, that was set up um, in response to, I think, a desire I had heard to be able to transfer development rights from uh, most of the town um, to be able to move development rights around when people um, didn't want to fully develop uh, a property in any of these zones. Usually the way transfer development rights systems are set up, there is a specific area that the rights come from and a specific area that the rights come go to. And those areas are usually different. Um, and they're usually a little smaller. Uh, so I had heard some concern about um, having development rights be able to transfer just all over the place. Um, one thing that Joel had proposed is keeping development rights in kind of quadrants of the town or neighborhoods of the town so that you weren't transferring development rights from the south end of the town to the north end of the town. Um, and so that, that is one possibility to set up um, a system of you can only transfer development rights kind of within a quadrant of the town so that the area that's being preserved is near the area that's being developed um, and uh, another, I think, even more restrictive and kind of smaller way to go about this would be um, to only to have some very small uh, areas where development rights transfer out of only the areas that the town most wants to protect. Um, and I think that would really probably come down to um, the Deputra and Hollow UNA and maybe the Durfee Hill Oak and Woods UNA 
um, just a couple of UNA areas that have development potential that the town really doesn't want to see development happen in. Um, so those are kind of three ways that um, a system could be set up. It, we could go with um, multipliers that encourage transfer from the highest priority places to the lower priority places, but allow kind of uh, a wide range of transfer directions um, or transfers within uh, quadrants of the town only. So if you were in um, Southwest DMB, you could only transfer to another parcel in Southwest DMB um, or designating a much smaller sending area, something like um, the most important UNAs that have development potential. Um, and then we could set up areas where those can go to. So I'd like to start discussion on those three possibilities um, and hear what people think about that. Dave, I'd like to say something because I missed the last meeting. Yeah. Um, first of all, I've been arguing all along and trying not to be argumentative that in rezoning, you're taking the value of land away from your large landowners, especially those in the better ag areas like Sapansky, myself and, and others. Um, obviously there's some personal uh, implications there. So I'm biased, but others are as well. Um, and you can see it very clearly in these TDRs. Um, I, I think the least restrictive is the best way to go because if you're transferring them, why would you restrict where someone can transfer their rights as long as they're within the town? And if we're really trying to do a, um, a thing where we're putting density in certain areas, allowing them to go from, let's say, Southwest Danby, which is fairly rural except along South Danby Road, up into the Hamlet or even closer to Ithaca where you have more um, building pressure and it's only gonna grow over time, um, makes more sense than saying, no, you gotta keep them in the same zone so that you get some higher density. I mean, I don't know if Rhonda's on or not and I really don't want her to react to this, but imagine if somebody down the road decided they're gonna transfer development rights from a neighbor up the way a mile to right behind her house and increase the density to two acre lots, that would freak her out. And I'm sure there's people who would um, be in a similar situation. Um, so that, that, that's my concern at this point. Now, the last point is somewhat addressed by the limitations on how many you can transfer in um, to a lot. So you could yeah, I just, you could, I just you guess I have a lot on it. You saw my letter that I wrote to you and David. I'm not gonna, you know, go through it, but I think I think there's a couple premises that we're working on as a group that are false premises and assumptions. We all work on assumptions. One is that preserving our land is important. Now, I like open space, I like preserving land, so don't think I'm a developer who wants to develop. But if you drive an hour every direction from our town, there's open space everywhere. It's just like trying to preserve a penny. You know, there, pennies are so abundant, why are we trying to preserve it? And in doing that, we're taking so much from landowners and nobody's acknowledging that. I'm calling it a take. I know David says it's not a take legally, but it is a take because you're devaluing the value of land paid for, bought, and um, paid in taxes by landowners. So that's one thing. The, the, other, the other thing that's, that's really a false assumption is the idea of fragmentation, which I will eventually address. I'm a busy guy. It's not top of my list, but I will deal with it. And I guess the way I'll deal with it here is I'll ask this question. Name a single animal whose population is harmed in our town by fragmentation of driveways, longer driveways and all that. And why aren't we doing anything to get the houses off the road out of sight because it's rural character that we're trying to preserve, not stop people from coming to our town. And this reduction of the number of building units on rural one and rural two from 
a single family, a two, single or sec, two family to only a single family makes no sense to me because a two family that's attached is the same as a single family, except you got twice the number of people. But we're still going to be somewhat rural. We're never going to be like New York City or something like that or downtown Ithaca. Um, if, if you think even of the Bronx, which developed after Manhattan, I mean, the Bronx used to be a farm. That's why, in my understanding, it's called the Bronx, because it was a huge farm what, owned by the Bronx family. What if they had done zoning like this, which didn't happen back then, and said, no, we're going to preserve it. We like open space. We like farmland. You wouldn't have a developed Bronx. I mean, it just, it would have been insane and make no sense long term over the centuries to have done that. And, you know, are we in fact doing the same thing when we're right on top of Ithaca, which is one of the fastest developing areas in New York State? And even during the recession of 2008 to 2012, we were a growing area, not a recessional area. So I've kind of said my piece. I'm, you know, just trying to put some facts out there and some logic to make us think and reconsider what are the underlying assumptions that we have? Oh, there's one other. Class two soils. We're, pre we're preserving our best soils. Our soils suck compared to the region. <laughs> you look at the, uh, thank you for the laugh. You look, where are the Amish and Mennonite going? They are your future farmers. They are your premier farmers. They're all going north. They're going 30 to 60 miles north of the um, lake, up in those areas where you have class one soils, much better than Danby. They're never coming to Danby. Um, it's kind of like if our best soils were wetlands and some wetlands were farmable and some were not. And we said, okay, we want to preserve our best soils. I, I just guess I asked the question, why? Um, some future time when there's pressure on food, those five acre lots, on Nelson Road, they can plow them up and, and farm. They can grow food there. I just don't get the idea other than seeing it as restrictive of people's freedom. And and I believe in freedom. I think our country was founded on freedom. I don't hey, Russ, like seeing it Russ, taken. Yes. Can I, can I jump in? Um, sure. If, if I could try to focus you on the question that we're trying to address, which is kind of the methods of transfer of development rights or the scopes of transfer of development I, rights. I did, I but what's getting us to that question is all these premises is that are false premises. I mean, it really is, David. I mean, why can't you have a two family house instead of just single family on what is it, rural one or rural two? Well, I think we've actually, we've made a way that you can um, either by having more land or by buying a development right from another parcel. Yeah, but it shouldn't have to be bought. You're, you're taking it from me. Right now, on the current thing, I can, for every five acres, put a two-family house in. And now you're saying, no, for every 10 acres, now you can only do a single family. You want to put a two-family, go buy it from somebody else. You've taken my value. Do you see? That's what I'm saying. Right. Yeah. The, the, the town's comprehensive plan, and I think the general direction of the town has been that we want to reduce the development potential in the rural parts of the town so that it isn't um, the town of Ithaca. I don't think anyone's concerned it's gonna be New York City or even downtown Ithaca. There's concern that it would be divided up into five to eight acre lots over the entire town and be suburban sprawl for the thousands of acres that are all of Danby. And we can see it going that direction if we don't make change. And I think there's a clear mandate for change, even though, of course, not everybody is going to agree with that. Right. Um, but so our, why our haven't task... we dealt with the building along the road and getting further, further setbacks? Because we haven't dealt with that at all. It's just going to continue. The easiest way to develop is right along the road with a short driveway, 100 feet from the road, and it looks like suburbia. We, we have not so, dealt with that. So, Russ, Russ, I'm going to jump in because we have spent a lot of time talking about that, and there are significant differences. What we're talking about is reducing development overall um, and the impacts of the total build out of the town. Um, and we can talk more, we can talk more about road frontage, and I think that that is something to discuss. But right now, what we're discussing is the transfer of development rights. Well, how does, that, how does that preserve rural character then? 
reducing number. It's not going to, because you're still going to have the every 200 feet. You can, I mean, I just missed one meeting. I've been on 16 months or 18 months of these meetings, hundreds of hours. I've heard all of our discussions. Um, every 200 feet, you can still build a house along the roadway. We haven't actually talked about the frontage in this round yet. Um, um, but it's a, it's a significant concern. I, sh I share Russ's concern about the, the houses migrating to the frontage, but I think that the, um, the proposal, at, as I understand it, would, will help address that in as much as uh, the, the options for, for these rural zones that are not the neighborhood zone that we already left the rules the same on were that you, you either had to have a large lot we had to have a cluster and and a cluster if you have it has to be 300 feet from an existing um, lot uh, existing dwellings yeah, so, yes so they're either going to be pretty far away along the road frontage or they're going to be back mm -hmm. but you're still not dealing with that in other zones like, well, we're not dealing uh, with it in the neighborhood zone because we already said said that that's mostly already developed the way the current rules are, you know, a lot every 200 feet. Uh, and so we uh, said, you know, neighborhoods already exist. We're going to acknowledge reality. We can't pretend that it hasn't already happened. Okay. So to answer Dave's question, I would say the least restrictive, the better. Transfer them anywhere in the town, but maybe put in something where it goes from a, well, I don't know. It, it, it cannot go from a residential to a R1 or from an R1 to an R2. It's got to be equal or more dense zone, but anywhere within the town. That would be my thing. Um, you've already taken away value of, of people's land who are large landowners or residential or the areas you want to preserve. I think giving the incentive is a beautiful thing, saying we'll let you, if you build, you can put one unit for 10 acres. But if you transfer, you get two. That would incentivize somebody selling off their development rights, preserving rural, and moving it into a equal or more dense zone. Yep. Or yeah, even well, the gist of what uh, David was proposing. Yeah. 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 Well, I just see the um, un unfinished roads thing as the doubling factor versus the uh, better soils or the rural one or rural two. I, I, that chart seems to say it's just the, the Deputron Hollow Road or some other road, the, the Bruce Hill Road, um, that's not a, a, a um, finished road. But Steam Mill Road, where I live and have 124 acres, uh, would not qualify for that. Now we've got, there's more to talk about, but we have to kind of focus on subject matter, you know, that's at hand. I mean, that, um, so I'd like I'd like to hear from others, <laughs> like Thanks. like Leslie, for instance. <laughs> um, so I'd like to hear more about because I, I, I agree with with Russ in the, on the I think on the on the being able to not having to stay within a quadrant, which I mean I guess I'd have to see a map and how it was going to be divided out as to what the quadrants were. Um, but I mean if. I want to hear more about why you feel like it needs to be within the same quadrant. Well, my, my feeling was, and, and I, what I proposed, I mean, David simplified it by, by, by suggesting quadrants. I suggested that the, it should be within a mile. And, and um, uh -huh. yeah, really. Um, mm -hmm. and, the, and, and the reason was so that the, the, uh, the benefit would be to the people in the area uh, that wh wh where the transfer is happening. In other words, you're you're preserving some of the back acreage. You're developing more of the frontage, perhaps, or you're, or you're enabling clustering. Um, but you're but you also will benefit because it's your area that's going to be the overall density is not changing, but we're transferring the rights off of the parts that we would like to preserve. And moving them to areas where we where we don't mind so much that the houses be clustered. Um, if you transfer, but, but you're restraining that. You're actually restraining that. I mean, you, by by having a smaller area, you're, you're defeating the purpose of that, which is to transfer from uh, 
from a, a very desirable, preservable area to a hamlet-ish, to a place where you want development to happen. If you restrict the, the if you circumscribe it, then you prevent a number of those possibly from happening. That's certainly true, but the- I agree with Jonathan. The, the thing is that, well, as, as I saw, the, the only place we really wanted development to happen is in the hamlet. So to me, you know, all of this area that we're carving up outside of the hamlet is, is a matter of, you know, how the development happens in that area. And my initial impetus in suggesting transfer development rights was the, was the thought that without changing the overall density, you could, you could, you could allow for, uh, you know, duplexes and, you know, threeplexes or, you know, quadplexes, you know, three, two, three, four apartment houses, which would concentrate the population, but reduce the environmental impact over having single family houses spread all over the place. Uh, and uh, we've been enabling that by, by doing the transfer um, provision. So, so, so the whole, um, as David mentioned, as TDR normally happens, you have a receiving area and you got a sending area. The presumption right. is that the receiving area has some desirability about it where somebody would want more development rights there. We don't really have any such place in the town. The, 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 the natural place that might, where, where the desire might exist to increase the density is going to be if somebody says, well, I really have, I've got this lot. I'd, I really like to put a three apartment house or a four apartment house on it instead of just a single family house. Well, great. But um, uh, that means that if you buy the, the rights from others in that neighborhood, yeah, within a mile, to do it, we've reduced the development potential in that neighborhood um, for sprawl. I don't um, know where it's going to happen. Yeah. I think the problem is that's not where it's going to happen. You know, someone's going to want to put in a fourplex, not in 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 a close proximity to a preservable area i kind of agree with russ's idea the the idea that you'd want to be able to sort of sell your preservable area rather than feeling pressed to subdivide it and sell it to places that are already somewhat residential we're not totally clear on how things are going to look 50 years from now well we're not at all clear but let's say 20 years from now the the residential ish areas not just the hamlet may be uh the desirable receiving areas for development rights for TDRs. Mm -hmm. But we kept the right, well, I mean, the, to, to me, the, the most uh, likely place for development to want to be denser is those places which we have called neighborhood, you know, pink, uh, the zone, the pink places yep. already. Uh, right. Could be. They're mostly developed right. already. Yeah, well, they are mostly developed unless you want to increase the development. You know, if you've got a five acre lot and you've got a two, a two family right. house on it, why not put a four family house on it? You know, uh, or, or, if we, or if we're single family, you may, might want to add an apartment by and by, you know, so, so, but, so, but, but I think if we, if we, if we went with the flow, so to speak, the natural thing would be for the development rights to migrate from the south end of the town where the development pressure is least. Um, to the north end of the town where the development pressure is highest. Um, you, um, you're, you're muted, um, Leslie. <laughs> I mean, I, I, we just sort of disagree. I mean, you're, yeah. you're, you're circumscribing time and place. Right now, you're talking about certain pressures, but as the hamlet develops, the south end gets more popular. And who knows what's going to happen, kind of as Russ describes, as Ithaca pushes its way out here. I really think we, we need to leave there be leeway for the sending to the receiving. I, I, don't, I don't think your picture allows for enough flexibility on the way the town will end up being. And I think the zoning does. I think, as you say, these resident, the pink, the pink areas should be the natural receiving areas, but I wouldn't even restrict it that far. Ted's got something to say. Oh, <laughs> there, there are so many balls in the air right now that I'm, I've got a lot to say. First of all, my simplistic view of all of this is that if there is transfer of development rights, it should always be from a more restrictive zone to a less restrictive zone. Um, in other words, from the rural areas to the developed areas. 
Yep. Now yep. that that that's one. That's just an overall thought. Um, I just heard several times the pink areas described as developed areas. No. Yeah. Well, people. But or something like that. More than that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I would just like to. I'm just talking aloud here. Do we have enough zones? If you think of them as developed areas, then we need a zone that says where we want development because we've already named the other zones, rural character and high priority preservation. So we obviously are, are just by the names, we are not thinking of them as places where development should be encouraged. Whether or not you have an extra zone in which you're gonna encourage development, it's, it's those dense areas where the, where the pressure is and where people should be putting more houses in. The idea of regionality, I think, I'm sorry, Joel, it just makes no sense to me at all. Uh, if you dealt with it by quadrants, uh, that, sorry, I, I just can't wrap my head around that at all. But even if you said one mile, uh, let's pick a, a square that is surrounded, those of you, who, I hope you can take the geography with this, the, the more or less one mile square that's surrounded by West King Road, Jersey Hill Road, Comfort Road, and Yaple Road. Are, in, in what way is it legitimate to consider transfer development rights, let's say from King Road to Comfort Road as being in the same neighborhood? There's, they're not, they're within one mile, but they're, they're completely separate areas. So neither the regionality nor that one mile criterion, I think you could, I don't think they make sense. I don't think you could make a criterion that of that kind that would make sense. Um, an, another ball that was in the air is we keep talking about density. I've said this before, as if it was viewed from space. But the fact is what we actually see is density from right on the ground. And move, you know, you definitely um, don't want to be <laughs> creating three houses over here in order to preserve one house over there. I don't. I just don't see the point in that. Um, and uh, finally, uh, <laughs> the whole purpose of zoning is to try and encourage development in one place and and not in another. I think the zone should reflect that. Well, well, the trouble is that, you know, the, the premise, what the starting place was the comprehensive plan, which is we want to encourage development in the hamlets and discourage it outside of the hamlets. Yeah, oh, by we've, the already, way. we've already, we've already um, deviated from that by, by conceding that we already have developed neighborhoods outside of the hamlet where that has already been, uh, we've lost the battle, so to speak. You know, the development has already happened there. Um, if we're going to, if we're going to start saying that, well, uh, it, it's not, we, we, we do want to encourage development outside the hamlets. Well, why? I mean, if we're going to have, if we're going to have a, why have would a sense it, of place. It's the opposite of preserving rural character, whatever you define rural character is. And by the way, I, I, I really should have said, uh, although we're talking this chart, uh, if it's reasonable to do so, I see no reason not to, not to, to enable some kind of development right transfer into the hamlet or maybe even require it in order to incur, you know, strip, you know, the strip development from one place and put it where we want it. So it, it should, in that sense, it should be included in this chart. Well, we actually did, we did talk about that in a previous meeting and came to the conclusion that we'd prefer to not require someone who wants to develop in the Hamlet to buy, to have to buy development rights. We want to make it as easy as possible. So because there isn't a restriction on development rights in the Hamlet, it doesn't, there's no reason anyone would buy them. You, 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 make, you make a good point, but I hope you see the point I was trying to make as well. You know, I do, I do. And I, I do want to address what Joel said, which I, I think that is a bit more of a simplification of what the comprehensive plan says, because I think the comprehensive plan has kind of a broader, a broader set of values than just uh, develop in the hamlet and discourage development everywhere else. Like most comprehensive plans, there's a million ways ours can be interpreted, and there's a whole bunch of sections on things about encourage uh, economic development and um, you know support business and jobs and a whole bunch of things that go beyond kind of 
the view that I do share that we should be focusing development in the hamlet and reducing it elsewhere. And I think we are doing that in general, but we are balancing, um, we are balancing those uh, competing goals and property rights and other things. So I think but, thinking but, that pe people are going to build in a house or an apartment in the hamlet is, I don't see any reason why anyone would want to do that. Uh, you could build in Barna and be a whole lot closer to building it in Danby. I don't, I just don't see that there's any attraction to being in the hamlet of Danby. There's attraction to being in the rural part of Danby, but I don't see that you're going to encourage people to build their apartment complex or whatever in downtown Danby. It just doesn't seem reasonable. That's why we haven't had it happen. Uh, and if it's what we want to happen, we have to incentivize it and make it easier. There has, there has been interest. There has I, been some interest in the five, five years. Hey yeah. guys, if we, if we incentivize moving your development rights from a zone that's more, that's uh, least restrictive from that, double them there, but if you go from R1 to R1, you don't double them. That would incentivize moving your development to a less rural area. I mean, that yeah. really does work beautifully. That, 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 is, what the, can I? that is what the table proposes. Um, so jo Jody, I'm gonna turn over to you in just a second, but I just wanna okay. remind everyone what the table proposes, which is that if you move a development right out of the high priority preservation area, it's worth four development rights in a, a less restrictive zone. Mm -hmm. If you move it out of the rural one, it's worth two development rights in a less restrictive zone. And then if you move it from rural two or low density residential, it, it stays worth one, unless it's on a minimum maintenance road, in which case it's worth two. Um, so th that that is what is proposed on the table. With that, with that in mind, mm -hmm. that yeah, we do want to encourage um, the transfer going in that direction. Um, but also, you know, it doesn't preclude you if you are in rural two and you have an existing small lot. And, you know, I had a woman call me a couple of weeks ago who said, you know, I want to, um, I want to subdivide a lot for my daughter. And, you know, I've got, I think, seven acres. And I said, well, you don't have enough land under the, the current rules to subdivide. Um, I think with this system, she could buy a development, right? And she wouldn't get any multiplier because she's not in a less restrictive zone, but she could buy a development right from a neighbor and uh, have the ability to do the extra subdivision. Um, please, and, please clarify, is it development right, rights to subdivide a lot or rights to put a residence on a lot? So development, it's both. And yeah. I understand that. I think it gets, it gets, it gets confusing is to, you know, if you have a 10 acre lot and you buy a, develop, a couple of development rights, that means you can make small lots or that means you can put a bunch of things on your existing lot? Both. It means yeah. that you could put three single family houses on the existing lot, or you could put one triplex, or you could have three single family house lots. Okay. And another practical question in the same line, so let's say I'm in a zone which has a, a, a two times multiplier and someone wants to buy one development right. Yeah, Can I sell half? Way. I mean, what, what, how does that work? I think you would have to, it would, you would have to sell the two. But he doesn't want to buy two. Does that mean I can never sell one? That I lose, does my multiplier lose its value if people just want one? I think so. Or you could replace it. I mean, once once you do the transfer, um, they could retain an extra unused development right if they wanted, or you could find someone else to buy it. But I I do think that you can't retain the right on the property that comes from the multiplier because the multiplier only exists when you transfer to the less developed lot. Well, if you simply if you trans. If you tran if you're in a two time zone and you transfer one right, you'd be left with four and a half. <coughs> What's wrong with that? 
you don't have two times the rights in your zone. You only have the right, the double when you transfer out of your zone. It, when you, under those conditions, would you be left with two and a half? Why not? I, so. yeah. I, I don't think that's workable. What, what's wrong with it? If you're left with only a half, then you can't sell that. But if somebody wants to buy, if you want to sell one there and one there, separately. And, and you make a wrong? great... You make a great point, but I think what he's saying is you would sell your one development right as two to the other person. They could develop one of them and they'd have one left over, which I guess they could just trade out one for one. I, and I could understand. Not double since it's already doubled. I understand. There could be, there could be a role for- drive down the price. There could be a broker's role for the town to play in this too, where, where people sell their rights to a, to a pool and then, and then others buy it from the pool. That might work, but that would also, um, in a sense, uh, not, not that I'm up with capitalism, but uh, with, with, with market pressure, but that might also tend to depress the value of the development right. It could. The development right only has value in a market. It's worth whatever someone's willing to pay for it. And that right, may mean it's at worth- the moment, At the it moment I sell it to the pool, it might not be worth the same when it's removed. Yeah. What? That's the problem. Yeah, there uh, is no set. There that. is no set price for a development, right? Just like there's no set price for a lot now, and there's literally no price for the ability to have a lot now. Um, there's no way really to price that. Um, so, you know, it's worth what someone's willing to pay for it, and mm. we we can't really facilitate a way for you to keep half a development, right? Um, if you did it, if you did have that pool that, that was just mentioned, um, if it were in, implemented so that it's basically the right is held in escrow with no money exchange, on any money, the, the money exchange happens only when someone actually buys it. That It'll might solve a, our problem. It could be yeah, basically a, a marketplace. <laughs> I don't so think the, the town wants to be in the business of buying and selling rights. It's, and there's when development rights are transferred within one year, the assessment has to be updated to reflect the loss of the development right on one parcel and the gain of a development right on right. another parcel. And the yeah. person who buys it, whether they utilize the right or not, they now have the right and they're taxed based on having that right. Um, actually, that. I did. That's the. I sent you email that I had a conversation with Irene Keo about that, and her initial reaction, although she's going to get back to me, is that the uh, seller of the rights it does not change the actual um, value of the of the land of the property, and the presumption would be that the buyer would immediately obtain a building permit and the the the, the the building permit would be the trigger to change the to uh, trigger the change in the value of the receiving lot. So the, they would her initial reaction only was that the actual transfer development right wouldn't do anything. It's the exercise of the development right that does it. I don't care whether or not the, the assessment department thinks it changes the value or not. But what matters is that the that is that the is that the right be recorded so that it can't be exercised once it's seated. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. really matter to the town, but just to be clear, the state law that enables transfer of development rights says verbatim, within one year after development right is transferred, the assessed valuation placed on the affected properties for real property tax purposes shall be adjusted to reflect the transfer. The, according to Irene, the, their formula for evaluating uh, evaluating land is not um, what it is what its potential use is, not it's what its actual use is. Well, you're so, right because currently, when you put your land in a um, conservation easement, they will not reduce your taxes one penny. And that's that is correct. their viewpoint. They not only do that in practice, but I've had the same conversation, and I don't know the person's name down there. That's why this. Um, state passed legislation being a passed by our town board and allowed for landowners to do that is so essential because it basically will tie their hands where they're faced to follow state law instead of making it up as they go. 
Yeah, and so, so just to be clear about that, what, what they're saying is that when they see comparable sales happen, when they see a sale of a parcel, say 100 acres that has a conservation easement on it, they're not seeing a significant difference in price between a 100 acre lot with a conservation easement and a 100 acre lot without a conservation easement. And if both of those lots sell at the same price, there is no difference in value. There is no reduction in value from that conservation easement because it sells for the same price. That may not always be the case. Um, I think what they're saying is that's what they have seen in some circumstances. I've worked in places where there is a substantial difference. I've worked in places where there isn't a substantial difference. It depends on the market to some extent. It may depend on some lots. Um, in a market like Tompkins County, there are people who will say, ooh, it has a conservation easement on it. That means it's green. I'll pay more for it because I want land with a conservation easement on it. Um, but it hasn't happened yet. Personally, uh, I think those people don't understand the difference, but I've also, you know, I've had people say, you know, my house needs to be in a more restrictive zoning designation. And I say, well, just don't build something more on your lot if you don't want something more on your lot. Um, so, but uh, people don't always understand that. But the, the reality is that uh, assessment is basing their assessment of properties on comparable sales. So they will have to figure out when people start transferring development rights, they will have to figure out what that development right is worth and assess it appropriately. And that's their job, it's outside of the town, but there will be some value. It may be very small. Um, and you know that's for assessment and also for the buyers and sellers to work out what it's worth. I, I think that there's enough difference between what you're saying, which makes sense, but between what you're saying and what I was, what I thought I heard from Irene, that it might be worth inviting her to one of these meetings so that she will, I could only convey my impression of what we're talking about, but so that she will understand what we're talking about and we will understand what she's talking about because we ought to, before making any decisions, we should certainly hear from that, from the assessment department. It's an important part of what we're talking about. I don't see where it is. If, what's, what's, I mean, uh, oh, if, if, oh, if, if, if you want an explanation of where it is, if I wanted to sell development rights, if I wanted to reduce by the theory that I'm hearing here, if I wanted to reduce my taxes, I would start selling development rights. But that's not what she said. It, it, it may not. If, if, if your objective is to reduce your taxes, selling your development rights might not be the best way. Yeah, you could just sell your property. That would work. Yeah. The, 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 the point of this is that we would be reducing the development potential where we don't want the land developed. And we would be uh, transferring that development potential to areas where we're willing to tolerate the development. What, uh, with, with if, it's, respect, if it turns out to be worth, if, if you don't want to sell your property, but you do want to reduce your taxes, and what you're saying is correct, then I should sell my development rights there because you're saying that would reduce my taxes while still owning the property. That's not what they were saying down at the assessment department. And I think we should have them here to explain that to us or to better understand what we're talking about and come up with a different answer. I think what Joel's saying is that we aren't concerned about what the taxes are. We're concerned with what the development build out is. And we're allowing that to be transferred around and what people are willing to pay for it and what their assessment is really isn't of primary concern. Um, Can I, I'm, excuse me? Yeah, Jody, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Jody. I've been waiting a while and you're way past what <clears throat> my one comment was. Back Sorry. a while ago, when there was a comment about only having, why would we want to have two and three family structures anywhere? I, I thought one of the things that we had said we wanted when we're looking at the town as a whole is a variety of options that people can live in so that it is a community that isn't just one thing. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I think if we, some people can't afford to go and buy two acres or five acres or whatever. So having the option of some housing where there's 
like three units or something in the areas that are like the hamlet or something like that is something I thought that we did want to encourage. Yeah. And I, I don't think I've heard, I haven't heard David say not to do that, but it, I think there was a comment that was kind of, we just shouldn't do any of that. Um, I certainly didn't say it. I didn't say you said it, Joel. I'm just saying, I think we need to keep in, in mind some of the things we said were the premises we started out with, mm -hmm. that we want an inclusive community. I mean, the TDR does add flexibility. Right. So, so that's just my I, comment. I'm not arguing with anybody. I'm just mm -hmm. saying. Yeah, I, I think you, what you said makes sense. OK. Thanks, Jody. Um, it sounds like, with regard to my first question um, for the hour, which was three kind of choices. Um, one kind of the existing table where we have the ability to transfer development rights pretty much anywhere with an incentive structure for transferring to the less, um, less restrictive zones from the more restrictive zones. Um, we were looking at that. We were looking at uh, having requiring the transfer to be nearby. Um, and then the other option was only allowing transfers from really the very most important to conserve areas like to Puget Hollow. It sounds like we have a general consensus of keeping the flex the more flexibility with an incentive structure. Um, Which of the three choices is that? The first one. It's the one that's in the table. Um, so it, I think that there was pretty strong feeling that that was the way to keep going. So maybe we can go back to looking at that table and, and work through some of the details on that. Uh, if we, just, just to be clear, the table doesn't specify which direction things go in. So you're saying that the most flexible scheme is to allow the transfer in any direction from anywhere to anywhere else. The table gives an incentive structure for transferring from a more restrictive to a less restrictive, but still allows transfer the other way. You just don't get the incentive. You don't get the multiplier. In other words, if you were in uh, in R1, you could get you could transfer from from an R2 or from an R1 or even from the neighborhood into it. Yeah. I I don't think I, maybe I misheard, but I don't think that was the consensus we were talking about. I think we were talk, we were generally talking about only out from more restrictive into less restrictive. Yeah, so, I think, yeah, I think I would, I would, I think I would, I would I'm, I, I, I'm inclined to agree with what, what, what Ted just said, which is to say that it should be possible to go elsewhere within the same zone uh, without uh, and, and and to transfer around and, or and, and from a less a more restricted zone into that zone, but not to transfer from from a less restricted zone into that zone. In other words, the flow ought to be all the direction and into the in direction of, of of less restrictive, but not the other way. I think that uh, you know, as you just stated, uh, David. If you allow people to transfer from a high density to a low density, then no. transfer it back out and get a multiplier. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You you Probably. can uh, you can do a circular transfer and end up with more more than you started with. Yeah, it, my my conception is that in this table that you're showing, you could only transfer upwards, vertically That's in reasonable. the table. Uh, you, whether or not you could transfer within your zone or horizontally. <laughs> well, yeah, well, I right. think I'm not sure, but not down. Yeah, you can go up, maybe up, sideways, not down, but not right. down. I think that's workable. I don't have a problem with that. It, it's different than what I said, but I, I don't think it creates any big issues to not allow transfers it, it, the other way. 
it addresses Lynn's point, which was an excellent one that, that you, you, you didn't want to be transferring from a, from a, a less restricted into a more restricted uh, because then you have a multiplier for going the other direction and you, you could create a circular increase in value by transferring it, you know, by going, yeah. by going the opposite I, direction. I, I don't think that we, there are plenty of other ways that we could prevent that by just simply saying that's not allowed. Yeah. Um, but I, I also don't have any issue um, as long as nobody else does with only allowing the transfers to be horizontal no. or down. Wait, wait, horizontal or down or up? Up on the table. Up on the, up table. On the table. Up on the table, down to a less restrictive zone. Right. I think that's fine. Um, but at, at the risk of driving it into the ground, less restrictive zone, the least restrictive zone on that table is low density residential. That's correct. That would correct. be the, the ultimate that would be the ultimate recipient, whereas high priority preservation, no chance of, it, of, get, of being recipient. Correct. Except no, well, from within that zone. From within that zone. Well, we've actually already said in this table, in the other row, max development right transfer onto lot zero, zero for high priority preservation. So it's not anyway. really an issue. Yeah, it's a zero. Um, so going with this general system, why don't we take a minute to look at these columns and I can explain uh, what they mean. Okay. Um, and we can, we can think through them. Um, the Please. first column is new cluster setback from existing homes on adjacent okay. lots. Uh, so I wanna be clear that this is specific to the siting of a new cluster. You wanna build a home on a lot that's not part of a cluster, this does not apply. Um, and it's not backwards. So uh, once you build a cluster, if somebody else wants to build a new house that's closer to that um, cluster, that is also permitted. So it's not, um, it's not creating uh, an impact on future uh, neighboring property owners that they can't build because this is created there, it, it just, applies at the siding of a new cluster. Could you elaborate on that? Because it's not, it's not clear to me what, what that means. Yeah, uh, try to use different words that are more specific. So when someone wants to start a cluster, they want to get approval for a cluster. That cluster has to be this distance, whatever the distance for the zone is, from any existing homes that are there when it happens. Define cluster. Well, a cluster. That's, that's an interesting point because a, a, any, any lot which is not, um, well, well uh, as we, as we lot, lot size, if you look back at column two, you know, less than two or more, or more than 10, uh, the, 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 the allow, this is, this is a, what, what Guy suggested. Um, that the the norm be the 10, which is to say, if it's going to be less than 10, it would have to be less than two, it would be part of a cluster. So um, it's, it's kind of a peculiar use of, the, of a clustering mechanism if we do it that way. But it, in effect, it says, it's, if it's, you have to have 10 acres, unless you are part of a cluster it's in a cluster that you have the two acre or smaller lots. Yeah. So it's possible to have a cluster of one lot. Uh, yeah, so I think we did that. We talked about that last time. It, I think it came as a surprise to everyone that a single lot could be a cluster. So I think it's a, it's a peculiar way to think of it. But the no, terminology is bad. I would call them mini lots, micro lots, something or another. The cluster seems to indicate that there's more than one. It yeah. does, um, and that's the uh, and that's and the that came as a surprise to everybody last time. Yeah, and 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 it's because of the well, it's because of the peculiar I would say peculiar use um, of the of the cluster subdivision. Well, you know, we we have a history of having done this in the past when Sue Beaners was code officer. Um, we we 
she, uh, she occasionally made use of the cluster subdivision option as a way of circumventing the rules on road frontage uh, and creating flag lots and, 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 flat, and lots with lesser road frontage by calling them clusters. Because once you, did, once you made it a cluster, you were exempt from the rules regarding, um, regarding setbacks. So is, is so is one house on an unpopulated lot is one house a cluster or do you have to have two? Well, because when to do a subdivision at all, you have to divide it into two lots. Uh, you, we're talking. Are you talking subdivisions or the building of houses? Well, the building we're of talking houses. Subdivisions. Excuse yeah. just build, we're talking subdivisions. So if you just want to build a house on an empty lot. Cluster does not apply to you. Okay. If you want to subdivide and create small lots, cluster does apply to you. What if you want to build two houses on an existing lot, existing you, unpopulated lot? You can build two houses on an existing unpopulated lot if you yes. have, if you got the development rights to do it, or you or you bring them in. Right, and is that a cluster? No, it is. It is. All right, Joel. It is because it is. <laughs> because of the way. It isn't in the low density residential because that allows two lots on a house, uh, two houses on a lot. Um, but in the other zones where the, the density is set by the area, um, we have to use cluster to enable the, the kind of changing of that to, to use the density from another part of the parcel um, to cluster it into a multi-unit building. So, so that, if, if I'm following correctly, a cluster is defined of, as one of two things, a subdivision or the placing of a second or more house on an existing lot. Yeah, there's two kinds of clusters here in that. In that well, uh, as long as we know what a cluster is, I don't care if they're the same kind. Right, and it's technically still, I, I don't wanna belabor the point, but it, it would still be a subdivision process, even though you were just putting the two houses on the lot, but it would be part of approving that, that as a plat that would allow you to, to basically do, use the density in that way. Um, right. But I it's think- not, that, It's not cluster subdivision then, because I mean, subdivision implies creation of multiple lots. Right. I, it really, I, I, it's, it's not, I don't, I don't want to belabor the details of it because it's really not consequential, um, but the process someone would have to go through would be a subdivision. They would be amending their subdivision plat to allow that. Um, but I, I'd really rather focus on uh, the impacts okay. of what I'm talking about with the setbacks because that's what's actually an issue here. It's how- right. it's, what, that's what do what you I mean by to... setback? Yeah, that's why I really want to clearly understand what a sub, what a, what a cluster is, because now we can talk about when that when that setback applies. Yeah, so go ahead. So, what I've drawn here is a set of lots um, straddling a street. So, uh, imagine that when you start out, you have five lots, and this cluster isn't here, but you have single-family homes on these two lots. When you put a cluster in, it has to be this required distance from any existing house. So let's say that this line represents that distance for this zone. This cluster would be allowed here. Um, what I meant by saying that that only applies at the time of creation of that cluster, it doesn't now prevent this landowner from, uh, I've got the wrong tool. Uh, it doesn't prevent this landowner from building a house here in the future, just because it's now less than the setback from that cluster. The setback applied for creating the cluster when the cluster was created. Um, but does it, it apply to creating the lot? If, if you- The lot already existed. The lot already existed, you're saying. Yeah. But you're talking about clustering of houses on an existing lot. What if, what if you wanted to put a second house on that lower left lot? This one. Yeah. Now, do, does that trigger the clustering? That would be, it would be a cluster to have two houses on a lot if it was in the 
rural one or rural two. Right. So the so the they would not apply to the first house there, but it would apply to the second and subsequent houses on that lower left house a lot. Yes. So that so that means that if you if you wanted to add a house to that lower left lot, or or alternatively, if you wanted to add to the house that's already there, with a second apartment, um, you would be, you would call that a cluster. You would. And if it was being added to an existing house, you would have a pretty good argument for a variance. Um, but if we want to require a setback for clusters, then, then that's what it is. And it's going to create some issues when somebody wants to do what you just described. I, I don't understand if you wanted to carve a small lot out of the lower left hand corner with no intention or plan to build anything on it, then how far does it have to be from what? Or is the setback only occur when you want to put something on it? I think that's I I think that's a good question, Lynn. And I'd like to hold it for now because talking non-residential subdivision is something else that I want to talk about. If we can create lots that aren't intended for residential development, um, or maybe I, intended but not immediate, uh, you know, re it's really two different things dividing the lot and then deciding to build something on it. Right? Unfortunately, it's not. It, if you're going to get treated differently for saying you're not going to build on it now, that has to have some sticking power. Uh, what we get right now is everyone who wants to divide a lot says, oh, I'm not going to build anything on it. It's never going to be a house. And then a month later, we get the building permit for the house because as soon as you have a lot, you have the ability to put a house on it. Um, okay. So. Let me explore the other half of, of, the, of the two cases of what is the cluster. So let's say you're starting with this existing house over here. And mm -hmm. this, this owner says, I'm gonna break my lot into two lots. That's a mm -hmm. subdivision. Does the cluster restriction apply to assuming that there's eventually going to be a house here and a house, sorry, a house here and a, house here, does it apply to those two houses individually, even though they're the first house on the lot because a subdivision occurred? How, no, how, only it depends on how big that lot was in the first place. You had, to have, you had to have had 20 acres in order to put that line down the middle. Yeah, let's assume. I, I, I'm kind of assuming that, yes. Yeah, so if the, you so have, if you're, just doing, lots. you're just cutting it into 10 acre lots, it's not a cluster. Right. Not a cluster until you put the second house on the same lot. Right. Which you then, you wouldn't be able to do at this point unless you brought in a development right from somewhere well, else. We, we are assuming, I, I, I'm assuming anyway, that we will eventually do that. Do what? Uh, have transfer development rights. Yeah. Sure. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm taking that as a given. Take that out of the equation and I think things change a lot. Okay. So are we clear on what the setbacks mean? No, well, what's not no, clear I'm, is I'm when, not... when you do another another cluster, um, how, what, what, were you, what were you saying about, you know, the fact that it's there doesn't affect um, subsequent uh, cluster placement. If you, if you wanted to put another cluster, say, behind that one that you just created in the middle up, up above there, would it have to be, would it not have to be whatever distance away from it? You mean you mean, for example, doing doing that? That okay. putting so, more houses back there. Joel, any new cluster has to be spaced away. What I meant that it doesn't apply to future things is that this cluster doesn't limit this property owner's ability to put his house as close as the normal setbacks allow. He doesn't have to be three hundred feet away from the cluster. And the cluster doesn't have to be 300 feet away from him because that house wasn't there when the cluster was built. But it doesn't, it doesn't create a 300 foot circle around the cluster that no one can then build in in the future. What if there's a second house? If it's a cluster, then it has to be 300 feet away. Okay, so he could, he, could, he could literally put his first house close 
but the second house would have to be further away than I've drawn if that's the line it would have to be back here. Yeah. Interesting. Do you have any other questions about what the setback means? If it were I behind still, it, I still don't understand that uh, you're basically saying that you have to have a plat plan before you can subdivide this lot or sell this lot. You have to be, I, I have to be able to tell you where I'm going to put a house if I want to divide this off. Or are you saying that the, the corners of whatever two acre lot I create have to be 300 feet from the nearest? other dwelling no if you if you if you want to subdivide a cluster of lots if you want to subdivide off a two acre lot you would go through the process of figuring out where you would put all the two acre lots you're entitled to and um, that cluster would have to be 300 feet away from any existing house all corners of that all corners of those properties need to be 300 feet away from the nearest house. Yep. I'm just trying to figure out exactly what you mean here. Um, you mean that? Well, no, and I didn't it, understand either because it because it, it, uh, when you, when you say it does not mean that there's a 300 foot circle around the cluster, why doesn't it mean that? Because if the, once that cluster has been created, then a, a, a new cluster would would be wouldn't it have why wouldn't it have to be 300 feet from it? A new cluster would, but a neighboring property owner just building a house on an existing lot wouldn't. There's no, there's no setback building. for putting one house on an existing lot. Oh, okay, yeah. except the for the setbacks that, are, that, that apply for, any, for, for a lot. <laughs> yeah. But saying that this, this, Two acre cluster lot has to be 300 feet from the nearest other structure is different than saying whatever house I build on this needs to be 300 feet from the from the nearest structure. And those are two different things and it's not clear what you're talking about. I'm talking about the lot. But if you but if you don't have to break the lot into smaller lots in order to build the house. Then it then it effectively does apply to the houses. Yeah, uh, it it's hard to wrap it your head around, but it's it, so in this case I think it works. I mean, this is all in response to concerns from folks that they for lack of better term, don't want clusters near their house. And, um, you know, I think what we heard from some people is they don't want anything near their house. And what we heard from Guy is you can't put a rule that you just have to separate new houses in that way that then creates, for example, you can't say, because I put this house here, you now can't put houses on your lot where you want to, um, which well, is different. You, if, if, if that larger house on the bottom, let's say the order of building was the solid houses first, then that larger house on the bottom, mm -hmm. that middle lot, you could put one house on it with no restriction. But yes. once you've got the cluster, once you had two houses, then that, that new house on the bottom does matter. Yep, that's exactly correct. Yeah. And I didn't, that's, I didn't that's, understand that's, that. You were, when, that's when very I... interesting. Could, what, you explain, could you explain that? Because I didn't, I didn't follow that. What Ted said is that. <laughs> All right. You had these two lots, and then this person built their house. Okay. And you're the owner of that middle lot. You can put one house here. Anywhere. Anywhere well, that follows anywhere. those required setbacks. Yeah, um, but you can't but, create the but you can't create the cluster because it's not you don't have three hundred feet. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But the the second house, you could put it at the back of your lot. The middle guy could put it at the back of his lot because it does meet that. 
you can put distance. it anywhere you want as long as it satisfies the setbacks for a lot on a lot. Right. But he couldn't he couldn't, for example, uh whoop, do I have it here? Uh, he couldn't, for example, just put it there uh, there because it doesn't meet the setback from across the street, but he could put it at the back because that does meet the setback from across the street. The first house is free. This, anything beyond the first house is where it gets tricky. Um, right. Well, to see that, that second house you just put on it, would it have to be separated by 300 feet from the other house that's on that, on that lot? Not on the same. Well, if I understand correctly, within one lot owned by one person, yeah. no problem. You can do whatever they don't please. As long as it's 300 feet away from the other ones. As long as yeah. it doesn't, yeah, it, the circles involve existing houses on sep on different lots. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure why you would want to or why you'd even allow multiple houses on the same, multiple separate structures on the same lot. Seems to be creating problems that will, uh, you know, I guess maybe you should allow people to create their own problems, but it's something that'd be difficult to sell, difficult to finance, difficult to do lots of things. Maybe. And, I mean, to consider Boysville Cottages. Those are multiple houses on the same lot on a grand scale, but that's what that is. And it's very common for people to contact me saying they want to put a house, small house for a grandparent or for a child. Um, and, you know, lots of people in this market are shopping for multi-generational, multi-unit um, living situations. I, I'm trying to buy a house right now and I wouldn't buy anything with less than two units in it um, because it makes so much sense to rent a unit to pay your taxes in this um, community. So I, I think there's definitely a market for it. The second unit isn't going to be worth as much as it would be if it was on its own lot, which in a way creates future affordable options. Um, and if people want to create a situation where they aren't able to subdivide off the second house on their lot, and they have to sell it as a lot with two houses, I mean, that's really up to them. I think. Hmm. Interesting. Our current zoning requires if you're putting a second detached house on a lot, you're supposed to do it in a way that you can subdivide the lot in the future. And to me, that makes no sense. It creates no end of problems for people who are trying to do it. Um, and there isn't really any reason you need to other than trying to make it easy for someone to do something in the future that they don't need to do. I agree. All right. Um, okay, other question, do we have, does ev everyone now understand what the setback is? And then the next question is, are they the right distances? So you've proposed uh, as much as a thousand feet for the high priority. Of course, the high priority preservation is, is basically the state forest and anybody who wants to, who's willing to be added in yeah and there's and there are no existing structures in the state forest so it's kind of safe yeah you could put, you could put two thousand feet wouldn't make that much difference except Rhonda wants to be in that area yeah so she could i mean it, it, it to, to use her as an example um since her lot is is, is existing, you, you couldn't add a second house to that lot because it would be a cluster. Well, it's so there's tiny. No way can, could, you can put, there's no way you could put a second dwelling on her lot. Well, hmm. it, so it, doesn't, it, it doesn't apply within a lot, is that what we said? Correct. So you could put a second dwelling on her lot. If she bought a development right in her lot's so like her lot's like a third of an acre so yeah except that um you in in that high priority preservation zone you can't bring in lots, uh, you can't so, yeah. bring in any development yeah. rights yep. you don't you only have the one that's there and, yep. and that's all it can be yep
So how do we feel about these numbers, 200, 300, and 600 feet as being reasonably protective? I think they definitely create some uh, clear, clear space on the roadway. Um, I did discuss with Joel another way of doing this, which would just be to require in any cluster that 50% of the road frontage of the parent lot be preserved as open, um, which would be another, another way to get at this, um, perhaps less complicated. Um, but although it's complicated, it works. Uh, yeah, the the only one that that attracts my attention uh, as a problem is in the low density residential, the two hundred feet. Uh, is that going to create difficulty for people uh, who might want to fill in their back acres? I'm not sure that I'm not, I'm not sure that that I don't like it anyway, but will it create problems? Do we have to consider that? Well, I mean, it's intended. I mean, even in those places, don't you think that the people don't really want somebody building right behind them? Right, yeah. <laughs> the the email I sent you today, David, about back lot. If, mm -hmm. as I now understand what you're saying, it would answer that question that I posed, wouldn't it? If it it's was a cluster, sort of, yeah. It, it well, yeah. <laughs> it, it, I'm assuming that the back lot would be the second house. Oh, but it, oh, but it would be after a sub. Would it solve the problem if I subdivide my 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 land and make create a flag lot with a lot behind me? The first house would be a freebie. So it really wouldn't protect in that case. Um, if you're clustering, the second house would, and you have an existing house, the second house would have to be 200 feet away. If, um, if, if, but if you're, if you're just talking about doing a subdivision of two acre lots um, and following the five acre average density, you know, you could put, you had 10 acres and you had two acres at the front and seven acres at the back, um, you know, someone could, could build on the back acreage. Well, I'm actually bringing it to mind uh, Gunderman Road. Um, there is one property on lower Gunderman Road that has a small road access and then it goes behind all the other lots on the Gunderman Road on the north side of Gunderman. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to picture in my head how the owner of that property might subdivide and what would be the implications of that. Is that the property that runs behind all the way almost to 96B behind the school? It's a long, yes. large. Yes, yeah. one that I one that I was completely Number 100. unaware of until recently. Mm -hmm. Well, they would. I mean, they would have to build a road to access those parcels. Talking about behind the school. It could be behind the school. It's a rather it running. It runs east west. It's a rather long property. Yeah. Um, I, would they necessarily so have I, to build just, a road or share, they would. a shared driveway do it? No, they have to have road frontage for unless it's an open development area. And not in the new one. We haven't mentioned road frontage yet. We haven't talked New York about State still yet. requires road frontage unless it's in an open development area. Well, if I may well, smile, I, I think that's, that's not, uh, that is not impossible to achieve. If they turn the driveway into a road, Right. If we if we change our road specs or add road specs, that would enable something that looks like a driveway to be to be a road. Then then it would open up some possibilities for, that don't right. currently exist with our with our singular um, fifty foot dedicated right of way road spec. Yeah. So my my question is, I'm, in that case where you have a lot that's behind all the others. 
is is the desire is the result that we're getting with that 200 foot desirable and i don't have a preconceived notion is it it's a question the, the 200 feet is only impacts clusters so if they're not doing a cluster it doesn't it well, doesn't affect it if it was this if they would if it remained as one property it instantly becomes a cluster because there already is one house and if they divide it up then what divided into separate properties with a shared access with a road, then what? Then they just have to follow the lot size unless they want to cluster, in which case then it's a cluster. I saw that Catherine had her hand up. Yeah, I wanted to hear what she had to say too. Well, like Joe, as Jody said, I my points there have been way past many times, but I do have a, a couple of questions. And, I find this very confusing, so I'm not, I don't have very much to say. But I, one thing I wanted to say way back to Lynn is that, you know, when you talk about whether or not people will come to the hamlet, we're not talking about whether they'll come to the hamlet this week or next month or next year. We're talking about the possibility for the long term. So whatever we do, all of these rules are not just about now, they're for long term. So if we could just keep that in mind, that would be helpful. The other thing is I'm beginning to get a little concerned that what we'll have, you know, all the setback ideas all over, we may end up with the dots of houses everywhere. You know, that's so there, it, it's a give and take. And I, and I don't really know the right answer for this. Obviously I don't. Um, but one other, just a practical question, David, um, I'm not good at, at estimating these feet. Now, if you if you just took the road from the park, which we all know, and you helped us by putting, you know, an imaginary mark down that road to help us notice to see what those feet are, it might help. Or the road, the road into the the driveway into the park. Yeah. Okay. Um, I saw that. Uh, so I'm going to work on that. Catherine, and I'll share my screen in a second. But in the meantime, I saw that Kim it has her hand up. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so just thinking back to the chart that you had up a little while ago, and the 20 foot front yard and the, I forget what it was, 20 foot side yard, 50 foot backyard. And then the thing that Russ and I have repeatedly said about having, um, you know, having for, maintaining rural character to put the driveways, make them longer, um, you know, which would be cost, um, cost strenuous for a lot of people. Um, but there doesn't seem to be any, I mean, is this something that could be put into these specs where the front yard actually in certain areas like rural one or rural two or both would need to be a certain number of feet from the road? Well, it is now, but it's probably not the kind of depth oh. you would be um, looking for if you were trying to hide the houses, though. Yeah, well, 20 foot is, I don't know, to me, it's ridiculous. We're just going to continue lining the highways with, or the roads or the back roads with, with houses. And, you know, that's not going to help our rural characters. It's going to look totally suburban after a while. Except that the lots need to be 10 acres in those zones. Yeah, but the road frontage is 200 and you've got a house just plopped right there 20 feet because because you can yeah 10 acres then do you any good if the house is right at the road and you had you know nine acres behind it um that's pretty hard to have 10 acre or larger lots with only 200 feet of frontage yeah how long how deep would that lot be um, 10 times 200, 2,000 feet. On nearly half a mile. Yeah, just like the lot next next door to you, <laughs> Catherine. <laughs> the, the lot that I, I sold was 165 feet wide by 2,000 something feet long. Um, um, so in, in answer to the lots on Nelson Road that are that way. Yeah, yeah, there are, they exist. In answer to Catherine's question, um, the part of the, the road that goes into the park from 96B to where it turns is 500 feet. 
it's a decent distance without being I mean, hugely far. Yeah, and that's a good goes back for sure. Yeah, and I would also say a downtown block in Portland, Oregon is 200 by 200. And a lot of, most blocks in the city of Ithaca are 300 by 700. So, I mean, Lynn's, Lynn's a concern here is also mine and, and also Russ's, uh, what I understand, which is that, um, you know, the, on, on, in the current scheme of things, the, the, the equity lies pretty much in the frontage because of the existence of the, of the, the main expense and in infrastructure, which is the road. So there's, there's a strong um, incentive to, to create lots that are on the road and, and to put as many as possible there. The, so we have, have we addressed the frontage as a, as a, as a, as a, as a part of um, that? Because I mean, we did at one point I was suggesting we have it be, make it be 300 feet in these other zones um, outside of that neighborhood zone that we already left it at 200 at rather than something else. But um, I mean, I, I, my, my impression, David, is that you're counting on the large lot size in order to help not line the road with houses. But I'm not sure that we don't, we won't get some of what we had when we had the, the, uh, the ministerial lot creation where if you had 200 feet and five acres, you were good. Then you ended, ended up with the 200 foot wide long strips uh, in order to create, you know, in order to get the five acres. And it's a bunch of that up on Troy Road and a couple of other places too. Um, it's possible in some parts of town to have you know, 200 foot wide, 1000 foot long lots, it's kind of a dysfunctional, you know, land um, divvying up. But um, obviously, there are some people willing to do that, because they think that's the best way to get their money out. Um, hmm. So we, we can't do what I what I suggested to address that was a 300 foot rule, which 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 guy objected to us saying you know you don't want to be, you can't really constrain one person what what one somebody can do in their lot by what by what by what you do on yours. Yeah, yeah. So I, I I'd like to wrap this up fairly quickly because it is a little off topic. It's what we discussed and decided on last time, um, and I'd like to focus us back on wrapping up the. TDR questions, but what we discussed last time was that with the substantial reduction in development um, total, mm -hmm. having the larger lots, um, that that was sufficient and is also paired with increased site plan review, which applies to all buildings in the rural one, um, where it, there's never been site plan review for single family houses in the past. And the site plan review criteria includes where, where possible having um, houses as hidden as they can be among other things. Right, and um, I guess I, I, I had forgotten, but, I should, but it's worth mentioning that, that what does address that concern, Lynn, is that in order to, to create those multiple lots, the trouble is they happen one at a time, but if somebody wanted to do multiple lots, uh, the, the, the planning board can mandate that it be done as a cluster and not that way. Yes, that's correct. The planning board can always mandate a cluster, um, but then we have also imposed double the size and site plan review in rural one um, and doubling the size in rural two and site plan review if they do more than four units. Um, so, it's not that we're doing nothing, we're just not doing the same thing that's been done in the past, which is um, constraining the shape of lots with uh, frontage width requirement. Mm. Uh, this, this is a slightly tangential question, but you've remarked in the past, David, that um, uh, there's a lot of, there are a lot of paperwork requirements in Danby that discourage uh, development here. Um, how do you how do you feel about requiring site plan review on everything which 
is not currently required, will that also act to discourage or is it a good thing? I definitely think it will discourage. It's expensive and time consuming. Um, but nonetheless, it's, it's in there. It's in there, yeah. It's in there for high priority preservation in rural one and for more than four units in rural two. Um, it's not in there for low density residential, which stays the same, the same things would trigger site plan review as have in the past. Um, okay. And similarly- so, so I could buy a piece of property from Russ and then own, and think that I want to put a house in a particular spot. And then we go to site plan review and you tell me, no, I can't put it there. I have to put it a thousand feet back from the road. Well, that would be unreasonable, um, but there would be well, discussion. It, it's a, lots of decisions are unreasonable. If you're gonna allow those decisions to be made, um, you know, I think clarity of uh, you know, what, what can be done on this piece of property ahead of time is very important. Um, otherwise, it really it discourages any kind of uh, development. Uh, if I want a house, a particular spot, and you tell me to put it somewhere else, um, I'd like those rules written down, not, uh, not, there would, there would be not, su not suggestions or encouraged that should say it has to be a thousand feet from the road or it has to be whatever. It has to be, I'd like to know that up front. I think well, that, that's, that's the reason that we have uh, down here on the table, a list of site plan review parameters. Um, and they're all suggestions, they're not mandatory. Right, well, because they need a degree of flexibility um, to, in order to be applied and to not completely prevent development. Um, so that, that's why there's some wiggle room in them, but they set the, the clear parameters that the planning board is looking at. So it's not just, does the planning board like you? Um, do, are the neighbors upset? It's how is it doing these things? And these are the, the things that you need to think about as the owner of a property. There's still um, suggestions and, and there's still disagreement. And I can think that I'm complying and you think that I'm not. And then I can't do what I wanted to do. In the case that, in the example that Lynn just gave, would, wouldn't he find out about the restriction before, as soon as he went into your office, it wouldn't actually go to the site plan review. If, if the cluster, if any of the setbacks required a thousand, you would be able to tell him that before you even purchase the property. Well, what he's talking about is uh, site plan review requirements and um, oh, they, these, these parameters say, for example, new development should be hidden or screened from the road and neighboring properties when possible, right? So that doesn't say your house has to be a thousand feet from the road. It doesn't say it has to be 300 feet from the road. It doesn't say it has to be 50 feet from the road. It says it should be screened or hidden from the road when possible. So if it's absolutely impossible, if you know the only flat part of your lot is right by the road and the rest of it is a cliff that drops off, um, then this wouldn't preclude you from building. But if there was a reasonable way that you could better address these parameters, the, the planning board uh, doing their job would have that discussion with an applicant of how the site plan could be adjusted to have the least impact on neighbors um, and on these parameters. I like the rules better than suggestions, but. But I mean, that's but I hope the, the, the point of, of, of having site plan approval is that you know, there's discretion and wiggle room as, as David put it. Otherwise, I mean, if you could just put rules and you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have site plan review at all. <laughs> I mean, we could just put rules. It's just more restrictions, more restrictions on the property owners. I think we're kind of up against the limits of what is acceptable to people. And if we made all of these things a hard and fast rule, um, I, I think that just makes this more difficult to move forward. 
but they are a hard and fast rule if the planning board decides that they're a hard and fast rule. Right, they're the they're the priorities, but how you meet them is flexible. So you but could the go. Planning to the planning board gets board. the the planning board has the final decision as to whether you're flexible enough or not. They do, yeah. I, John John does I mention had, something that's a good point is if you have a certain planning board that's bent a certain way, either more liberal toward development or more uh, conservative against it, um, your decision could go one way or another. I mean, it is a good point that, that he is making, but I don't know if we, we want to tie up as many loose ends as we can so we don't have another De Putrin hollow issue yeah. um, like we had. I get that. So, but these thoughts are really excellent. Yeah, and if past history holds true, which it may not, the planning board, the existing planning board, has not been a real stickler about us about about insisting on stuff. I'm sure Joel can tell the story of that that house at the uh, on 96B and uh, Beardsley, where the planning board wouldn't even insist that he move the house a few feet because he said it's going to cost too much to add to the driveway. They, they, the planning board has not insisted on unreasonable things, <laughs> far the opposite, so far in the past. So the planning board hasn't had these parameters. They haven't really had any good guidance for site plan review it's true. of what they were supposed to be doing. We haven't told them um, in a clear way what they should be doing. Um, which really leaves them in a difficult spot. So that's why mm -hmm. I want to develop this set of site plan review criteria so that they have something to stand on when they're going to say no to someone. Um, and they have a set of criteria that helps them um, address neighbors. Because one thing that a lot of people are confused about is that um, when someone's in site plan review, that what's being litigated is the rights of the neighbor. And it's not true. The neighbor doesn't have rights in site plan review. The property owner has rights in site plan review and responsibilities um, to the community and to the code. But just because a neighbor doesn't like seeing someone's house or doesn't want to have something else near them, if it's allowed by the zoning, they don't have a right in site plan review to change their neighbor's property just because they don't like it. Um, yeah. The, the property owner has the rights and the, those rights are limited by the site plan review requirements and by the zoning. In, in a sense, screen share again, you're, that, that, cause what, part of what you wanted to cover was that, that, that column, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, just to repeat something that came up several months ago in this discussion, what David just said is that, that the process of the followed the process followed by the planning board does not protect the neighbors. What does protect the neighbors are the numbers that we're putting up here. Those are those are the basic rules. Yeah. Is that, that fair enough? I, I think that the site plan review process also does protect the neighbors, but in a general way, not differently depending on how the neighbor feels. It is applied to everyone equally. It right. doesn't matter if your neighbor is grumpy or not. Um, it's the same rules for everyone. And, and even when it's rules like site plan review parameters that have some flexibility in it, it shouldn't be applied differently depending on how upset about development the neighbor is. It should be applied the same in every circumstance. When you right. say for all buildings, uh, do you mean all building permit buildings, including the uh, you know, uh, the storage buildings and uh, uh, where where are you looking, we're looking at, at site plan review for allowed residential uh, here's a residential building. So these are all residential buildings that you've been talking about. You're not you're not talking about non residential buildings. That's correct. Which means that non residential buildings have to obey the basic setbacks front rear side. Mm -hmm. but not the cluster setback. Correct. 
So you could you could get a whole bunch of garages right at the edge of properties, but they're not residences, they're just garages. Is it worth putting a size limit on what is not what is unreviewable or what is reviewable? For example, your 1600 square foot uh, garage, is that mm -hmm. reviewable? That become, that's sort of a gray zone. Yeah, I think I think that's something I'd like to deal with at a different time, but I definitely don't like the way our zoning deals with garages. It doesn't make any sense. There's no limit to the number of garages or to the size of garages, which is crazy, especially when we have a limit to the number of residential storage buildings, aka sheds. We have a limit and a size limit, but no limit on the number or size of garages, which I think has led to some goofy things and I'd like to address it, but I'd like to not talk about it right now. But not just, but not now. Right? That's fine. Okay. So have we addressed the questions you set out to address? No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me, where are we on time? We're getting there. Yeah. So I, th I think, I feel like people are understanding what the cluster distances mean. And I haven't heard any complaints about the numbers. Um, uh, the, the next category is the max development rights transferred into a lot. I think that's fairly simple. As we discovered, there's zero in the high priority preservation zone. So you can't transfer anything onto a lot there. Only one in rural one, mm -hmm. four in rural two, and two in low density residential. How do we get, um, why, do we go, why do we go from one to four? Uh, I think the rural one is where all the UNAs are, the steep slopes. We really don't want to be transferring a lot of units onto any lot there, I don't think. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. I, but continuing to allow one makes for that situation where, you know, you have someone who wants to add a house for a grandparent or for a rental income. Sure, you know, sure, sure. Yeah. Bear, bear in mind that if the lot is more than 10 acres or whatever the right number is, they have multiple development rights in the first place. Is that correct? Yeah. That's so correct. A, lar a large lot in rural one or two might start off with six development rights. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Again, I'm confused with the wording here. Right? You have, uh, you know, 50 acres, whatever. Um, you buy development rights so that you can divide into a bunch of lots. And then each of those lots can buy more development rights so that they can be, have even more things on them. I, no, it's a, I think it's a one-time thing. Is it all with, is it all? How do you know to, that? Yeah, um, is, it, is it with respect to the original lot as of the passing of the zoning or to the, that, that's the key point. Yeah. It's what Ted said. It's really with respect to what we would call the parent parcel or the lot as it exists when the zoning is enacted. Okay, then I think parent parcel would be better than lot there is uh, to. Um... That's fair. And I do, it's not impossible that we could do it the other way. It just opens the door to so much complication of you've got 100 acres and then you cut it up into 10, 10 acre parcels and then you add development rights to each of those. I think it just, our life is complicated. It's already enough confusing it. enough. Yeah. We're thinking about though. Um, so the, the, the question is why would you have a lesser number in the low density residential? Just because the lots are small. I think it's just more of a physics issue there. Well, I mean, they're, they're potentially small in R2 also. Would it be fair to say that those less than two acre lots um, don't qualify for, it, it's only the 10 plus that qualify for the transfer in. Do we mention that before tonight, earlier tonight? No. No, we, we haven't. No, I'm not sure it's, I'm not sure it's, we want to think about that, whether that's a desirable constraint or not.
I can see a reasonable argument for allowing more in low density residential. I'm just telling you why I made it less, um, which was just because the lots are smaller and I didn't want people to freak out that someone's gonna build a 10 plex um, in a kind of suburban context where it's right next to a bunch of single family homes that are all right next to each other. Well, we're not talking about 10, you're talking about, you know, the maximum would be a fourplex, right? If you went to four instead of two. Yeah. Um, you can, that, the, that's getting to the next, uh, two columns over the max total that you can have, including um, what you transfer in. So if you yeah. had, say, 10 acres, that would entitle you to two rights, and then you could transfer two more in, which would allow you to do a fourplex. Uh, just just to go for a second back one column, uh, does that that word the thing about lot versus parent lot? Mm -hmm. Does that apply to the, did, uh, does parent lot apply to the cluster sat back as well? I don't think so. So I, I didn't understand the question. Well, in that. <laughs> If you started off with a lot and it was subdivided into smaller lots, and then you started creating clusters, would it, would those clusters be with respect to the smaller lots or to the original parent? So if you do, if you divide it into, it gets confusing. If you divided the parent into four pieces, would the second house being built trigger the the cluster? <laughs> even though they're on separate lots. That depends on whether it's, it applies to the parent or not. I don't know what the right answer is. You could, I think you could make an argument for both. Yeah, I don't think it applies. I don't think the parent concept is necessary there. It's just whatever is in place at the time of the cluster application for that one. Sure. Yeah, okay. Long, as long as it's clear that that's what it is, and that's the way it is. I just think um, this whole scheme we, is going to be difficult to explain to people. But that's probably that's true. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, um, I just thought through the consequences of what you just said, David. Remember the, the drawing you put up there. Had you divided the original lot where you put the six houses, into six pieces, then the cluster would never, the cluster setback would never get triggered unless you were looking at the parent lot. You could yeah, but they would have to be, they would have yeah. to be 10 acre lots. Well, and they would have to have a road frontage. Fair enough. But it would, but it would still not trigger it, even even though they're building right across the street from an existing house. Yeah, you're allowed to build right across the street from an existing house, unless you're trying to do, put a second house on the same lot. It right, gets unless you're confusing. doing a cluster. I, I think you that would lead you to make a very good argument that this it should apply to the parent lot in that case, because you could sub, you could subvert the original intention by simply dividing it. I, I, I think we have different original intentions and I, I don't think it's an issue. Um, um, I'd like to focus back on the max development rights transfer into a lot mm -hmm. column. Um, and if, if we're comfortable with this breakdown so you're talking about transferring into a, uh, a lot at the time of enactment. Yes. We're talking and not, and not lots created subsequently. Correct. That's parent lot. It yeah. seems quite reasonable, David, what you have there. It really does. It's... Thanks. Is that Russ? Yeah. That was, that was Russ. Thanks, Russ. I can't see you all at once. So. Yeah. Um, if no one has any concerns with those numbers, maybe Leslie we can look. Leslie has something to say. <laughs> <laughs> Leslie's got her hand up, yeah. Go ahead, Leslie. Go ahead, Leslie. Um, it's funny because I was focusing mainly on the site plan review 
and the rural too. And knowing that, you know, we don't have the map up, but knowing that a lot of the places that that I'm familiar with are in rural too. Um, uh, and the fact that there's gonna be no site plan review and, and they could have four trans, you know, I, I just feel like those areas really getting uh, short shrift. I, mean, <laughs> I, I, I would like to have more protection on those areas than in the chart that's shown in the chart. Um, that's, that's just my. On, on my rule two. Thought. Yeah. Uh, rule two. I mean, even if, even if it's, you know, if there's site plan review and the criteria is different or mm -hmm. something, I just, um, so simpler. just just for just for clarity of what the yeah. current rule is is half the lot size and no site plan review unless it's four no i mean i mean the current zoning oh, the current, the current yeah. zoning you can't right. do four but you can do two with no right. site plan review right um so the difference would be Twice. you now have to have a lot more lot size to do say three, you would be allowed to do three without site plan review, but you would have to have 30 acres. 30 acres, yeah, that's. Okay. Yep, yep, I'm good with it. Okay, I buy your story. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Leslie. Mm -hmm. um, I'm glad you buy it. <laughs> But then the four transfer rights. Yeah, you have to have, yeah. Okay. And, and that second row, maximum four, direct, four rights into the lot in R2. Right. Yeah. Right hand column, it says site plan review required for four plus units only. Right. Yeah. Four units. Four plus. and more. Four and more. Four and more. <laughs> But you can't have more because you can only transfer in four. You can, you, it could be a 30 four acre lot where you had three to start with. You already have, yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. You had more than more than one to start with. You can right. Four more in. If you had 10, you transfer more in, you had 14, and now you have, okay. Right. Consider that. I might, I might. What, I might does be four more plus, comfortable with four plus mean four and and more and more or does it mean more than four? Uh -huh. It means four and more. Four okay. or more. I, um, I I think it might be more protective to say two two or more. Yeah, of course, it, of course it would. <laughs> it certainly would be. And and I think remember what I said a few minutes ago. These numbers are what do serve to protect the neighbors and to pr provide predictability for the neighbors. Yeah. And so this, this is this is where we're doing it. That's why I think two plus would be better than four plus. I agree, particularly since we you know we're doing we're going from all in, in the in our in rural one to yeah to four in rural two, and I kind of I kind of inclined Leslie's way in that. Um, and that you know, somewhat more protective would be good. You're talking about a 20 acre site, though. So I will remind you of the huge lot size that would be required yeah. for that. Um, and also, I I have a real problem with treating single family homes different than everything else. Mm. Um, and what you've proposed is that single family homes would have no site plan review, and any multifamily home would have site plan review, hmm. um, which I think is a real equity issue. You're would biased. it be better to use the word yes. buildings right. than instead of units? What? Would it be better to say buildings instead of units? I don't think so. Because that, that removes the uh, the restriction between single and multiple family. In yeah, it does, but it, but it also complicates things greatly because you know, yeah. we're trying to track is, is dwelling units. 
well, it's buildings below. I just don't think it's necessary with the acreage. Well, that's what, yeah, that's what Dave was saying. Yeah, well, I mean, look at the numbers. Again, remember that we're, what we're doing here is, is ensuring predictability for the owners of existing properties and the site plan review while there is, they have no, so <laughs> we say their, their wishes have no input to it. The site plan review should be able to protect them. And there's a big difference between four separate buildings being put in and two and two. Two, two buildings, you see? So well, is Ted, are what, is what you're suggesting that a, a 10 plex wouldn't require site plan review, but two single family homes would? Anything that in, uh, when I suggested, I suggested two things. One was to change it to two plus, right. and the other one separate was to change units into buildings. That's the problem. Yeah, I don't think that works. You build a 10 unit apartment building. Yeah. Is one, one building. One building. And yeah. Cool. I'm cool with treating a duplex as, 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 a, as a single family or a single building, but a 10 unit apartment building is a different thing. Agreed. That is, that is true, but. No, but. It, the problem is that by, by allowing that, you also allow, you basically say that you can put three buildings on there, whatever the size, without review, which 10 is extreme, but three buildings could be quite a lot of, uh, uh, quite a lot of visual impact for one thing. Mm -hmm. Well, that is, that is, that is in 10 individual buildings, though. But it's only going to be on 38. No, it could be. It's, we're talking, in that extreme case, we're talking one very large building versus so we, yeah, 26 acres versus three, two and a half, which okay. could be of unlimited size if they're single with, units. With, without site or site plan right. review. But what are the, what's the likelihood? So uh, to answer your question, if it can go wrong, this is Mr. Murphy. If it can go wrong, it will. <laughs> We're talking 50 years out now. Well, okay, 30 years out. It will happen. But, but what we're talking, what you're talking about is someone building three single family homes on a 30 or more acre lot. Right. Um, max residential units per lot, including transfer rights. We're talking can potentially 10 such buildings. Well, yeah, that would have site plan review if it's more than four units. Right. You were interested in the three, Ted. Um, Max to residential. So you have your 10 acres and you transfer in. If you have your 10 acres, because it's not only 30 acre lots, if you have your 10 acre lot, and you transfer in a few rights. So you're saying that you can get three onto 10 acres with no review. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is a set one per three and a third acres, which is essentially the, the situation that we're, we have now that we're trying, trying to minimize, not have any more of. And this is in the rural area, not in the low density residential creating a new low density residential area. Well, only if you transfer in. <laughs> only if you transfer in, but that's the whole system here. <laughs> that's the whole point. You could. Creating density one place for density somewhere else. Right, by doing that, you're preserving 20 someplace acres which, somewhere which, else. Someplace else. Yeah. So, um, well, well that, <laughs> I, I mean, you know, you're, you're forcing me to, to stretch right. further and further. And, and so I'll sell him one development. Right. I guess one, maybe we can, maybe we can, the rest. Ted, maybe we can just um, make this simple uh, because we are past nine o'clock and we have previously agreed on this column and we can just ask, does anyone want to further consider the four or more unit cut off for site plan review in rural two. 
You mean further consider, like, to change that? You mean? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. No, I, I mean, if nobody I else, if nobody else wants to, I, I mean, um, I'm inclined to say I'd like to think a little bit more about it. Um, I'll live with that. All right. Why don't we? Why don't we call it a night then, for where we're at? And I think the column that we haven't talked about is the max number of units per lot. I'd like you guys to think about that and next time we'll look at that and the site plan review parameters um and oh good you see yeah. and, and it'll be yeah. pretty sh short shortly after that that i'll be giving a draft to the town board so that's really um, what we have time to talk more about at this time, before it, the first draft would it be possible for me to make a drawing that you to illustrate the case of how the uh, cluster setback could be subverted. Sure. I mean, I, I I really think that if you're putting it in, you should make sure that it will apply. Uh huh. Okay. You're I welcome mean, to make a drawing, Ted. <laughs> sure. The, the drawing you had up earlier pretty much illustrates it. So. Oh well, then maybe there's no need. Mm -hmm. Well, he, you know, well, apparently you're not seeing that you're not seeing the way it could be subverted, so it, it is necessary. Wow, you're absolutely welcome to make a drawing, Ted. Yeah. Uh, with that, I think we can wrap up for tonight. I want to thank you all for being here. I'll be putting this video up on YouTube um, next week, and uh, we'll convene again in two weeks. Thanks so much. Just to be clear, this meeting's on thir on Friday, but the other meeting's on Thursday. That's right? correct. Two weeks. Yeah. From, yeah. Thursday right. next time. David, was there there's a is there a, a group working on on site plan parameters? There's a, planning, there's a planning board group. Right. So the, the planning board is working on the parameters for what should be in a site plan. Okay. Um, All the, right. Kind of That's the submission okay. requirements. Yeah. Um, okay. All right. Cool. That's great. Yeah. All right. Okay. I'm gonna sign off. Thank well, you. Well, have fun. Tonight. Are you? You're in Camden. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm actually, outside Belfast, but very oh, near Camden. We've yeah. been there a lot. We have been there a lot. Yeah. That's lovely. Good. Uh, Good for you. Have you been out in the open on the water, perhaps? Because your face I is have, showing when yeah. I, I think that's actually just the I always get warm in these meetings and I have a lamp on me. I don't what have a sunburn, on? although I do sunburn very easily. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I did spend some time out in Camden Harbor in my kayak. Um, oh, we've had it. every kind of weather we've yeah. had from I think 95 heat index um, to today it's in the 60s and we had a <laughs> ripping thunderstorm the other day. Yeah. Everything in between. No snow. Yeah, right. Well, just give it time. Maybe yeah. tomorrow. <laughs> Great. It's been pretty wild cool. here, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I heard Stuart yeah. Park got decimated again. I'm really yeah, sorry. I, went down, I was down there today. It was, it's, and they got hit last Monday and then the next, you know, two Mondays in a row. Uh, the crews were saying they had it all cleaned up and then this past Monday it hit again. So, and another storm. Oh, it was awful. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. Anyway, we'll have to plant something sturdier than willows going forward, I guess. <laughs> oh, oh, they're notorious. Not down yeah. there. No, they're the trees that grow in swamps. So yeah, that's, that's true. It. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, right. so so, so do red, the swamp. So do red maples. And... <laughs> All right. Good night, everybody. Okay. Good night. night. Have fun. Thanks, Dave. Thanks.